it's uh, it's nice to meet you again. We again. Met, we met sometime when what? 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 Two thousand seven or two thousand six? I think you came to California promoting your book. That was the book. Yes. This book. Yes. Yes. Eh? yes. It's the Manly Memoir. Which for some reason people still ask for. <laughs> well, I started reading it online, and then I got a copy yeah. from Kimon, and I I sat down and I read. Very interesting. I really, 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 really like it. Um, I, I am writing, well, I, I wrote a book um, on marriage, yes, um, I, it's a small book, that's my first, I don't know if I'm going to publish it, right? I'm writing another one on my on myself. Uh, You're writing my, another book before you publish the yes, first one. Yes, before I publish the first one, yes. I'm encouraging you to finish, you, you haven't published because you haven't finished. First book. Uh, you probably write, you know. You I'm probably write. So when you finish the first book, you publish it. But just make up your mind. So by the end of September, I'm finishing this book. <laughs> no, because if you don't, you never finish you it. You never finish it. No, so yeah, that's it. that's why it's nice to have a publisher. Like oh. in my case, he just wants to be able to stop passing around. Just give me the book. <laughs> <laughs> and I took my licks. <laughs> well, um. Today I am. I want to have a chat with you one on one because I've never had the chance of meeting a first lady one on one and talking to a first lady one on one. And um, and you have been probably one of the most prolific first lady in our history. Um, I'm Leo Gilling, and I have a little talk segment. But this segment here is where I come out, record, and I spread it across. Um, social media mm -hmm. and, and I can tell you from now that you probably are going to be the number one of all the other interviews that we've had so far. Yes, that's a nice vision. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's nice to meet you and could you, I, I know that you're an author, mm -hmm. I know you're an advocate, I know you're a first lady, you're very very um, involved in women's movement in Jamaica and the PNP movement also, and and so is there anything that I'm missing? Mm -hmm. Tell me. I'm a transformation practitioner, meaning I facilitate workshops oh. for transformation. transformation. Transformation of what? As this of the individual, then the individual takes that into all their relationships. And then from the relationships going to the wider society until the vision is huge, like my vision is a transformation of Jamaicans wherever they are. And what we mean by that is that it's it's a whole thing to do with self-inquiry. Who am I really? Am I the person who just makes speeches, struts around, just does a good job? But who in my heart am I really? So I go internal and I investigate my interior landscape to find out what drives me, what were some of the socializing elements that made me who I am. Was there anything that in my early childhood that happened to me? It could be anything, you know, it's not a blame game right, at all, right, right. but um, it could be my mother beating me instead of my sister. And what did I have that mean? I didn't just stop as a seven-year-old and say, that's what happened. I say, that's what happened, but what does it mean? Means she doesn't love me. And I can take that with me throughout my entire life. And it can stop me from being who I am and what I really, really want to do with my life. It's the most exciting thing I've ever done. And there are people who do this worldwide, and back education and cooperation. A lot of my training come from them. And they are headquartered in San Francisco, actually. Okay. Um, That's the same Tony Robbins type thing. Yeah, Tony is more motivational. Oh, okay. And I make the distinction because in transformation, you are actually given distinctions and tools that if you wake up at midnight and say, "Why did I not kiss my husband before I went to sleep tonight?" I know which tool I can use to make me see why. And that could be anything, you know. But it's usually something that is hidden from me. That gets unconceived. Oh. <laughs> and so when I get that, uh, it triggers me into an insight. And I can, it goes, whatever, yeah. you know, whatever, what I call hocus pocus, that I create with there, disappears. And I can now hug him really 
freedom. I love it, Leo. I do too. I love it. I it's inspiring. And of course, it comes with coaching. Yes. And I'm fortunate enough to be involved with a foundation. It's actually, well, it's in the family, EK's family, the Joan Duncan Foundation, which is really coming out of Jamin. That, that's his mom? That right. is, no, that's his first wife. His first wife, okay, okay. And we became very close, and she just said, Come, Beverly, I have to come and help me do this work. I didn't have a clue what she was talking do you, about. Do you have any known conflicts in self? Do you, uh, or is this is what you're saying Can to I me? Can I ask you a question? Am I a human being? <laughs> <laughs> Tell me about them, I mean, Of want, course, of course, uh, of you know, course. I, do, you, and do you process them and what, what, what do you do? Let me tell you, like for example, the book, my book. Um, in my book, I state clearly that I am the second of four children. Later on, mm -hmm. uh, we discovered, uh, discovered a sister who was born the same year as my younger sister. Oh. And we are great friends now. Okay. So when I talk about the family, I'm talking about the family I grew up in. Right. So I was the second. My mother was what you call in Jamaica high brown, mm -hmm. and she tell you with pride that she could sit on her hair. Oh. She then married a black man, so her children could not sit on her hair. Oh. Now I looked more like my father, as the darkest one in the family, and um, what I had all of that mean is that you know because I was black and our marriage was falling apart and all the things, the denigratory things that I said about blacks. You know, I was that outside. I was like, I was never on the inside. I was always a little bit on the outside because the brown ones were favored more than I was. And it was not until I started to do this work that I realized that um, this thing has stayed with me all my life. It was hidden from me, but it has stayed with me. And although I was a success, and I'm willing to admit that I am a success, what I did, I was always referencing that thing that I couldn't see. I don't forget what I mean. I do. I, I, I do. Some play. people just give in to it, so yes. they go nowhere. Yes. I decided that's gonna show them. Yes. You yes. know. Yes. So was, was mm -hmm. that was that? Are you seeing that now? Because I know your former husband. He was high, really high colored, uh, white. High brown. Yes. High brown, Some people right? thought white. Yes. Yes. And 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 did you? Did you bring that into with with you into that relationship? Or so you are you're, no, you're now coaching me, <laughs> <laughs> which is fine. <laughs> at the time, I didn't. I, I don't know if I was aware of it at the time, but right. I remember one weekend we took my mother, my father died by then, and we took my mother to Miami and um, to see if we could just have a soul to soul talk with her, find out more things about her side of the family, that kind of thing. And she literally shut up on us. She, she just would not. She said, you know, her generation never talked about things like that. So what's the point? It's happened already. Yes. It's gone already. Where you bring that up? Yeah, I like that. Well, okay. Yeah, that's the so, acceptance part. Guess what? Yeah. We were socialized yes. and, and be very frank with this. Because you never know. When you, when you speak from, a, from an authentic place, meaning from who you really are, People listening to you get uncomfortable sometimes. Yes. And guess what? They can have an insight yes. and they can realize it's okay, that's what happened to me. Maybe I don't have to hide it anymore. So this is how it works. Right. And um, one of the things she socialized us into, because her marriage to a black man was really that it was a love he was a lover. I mean he had um, he always had a girlfriend in the marriage, he, he, he drank rum, he, you know, yes. <laughs> and this created a lot of problems for her. And so she got to the stage where it was very contradictory because on the one hand she'd tell us about Marcus Garvey and Black Pride, on the other hand she'd say, none of you bring anything black in front of me. Oh, wow. And guess what? Years later we realized that none of us did. Oh? We didn't know you. It was not in that Miami weekend that we were talking. I said, oh my God, the three sisters sitting there, all of us had married high brown men. Oh my. And they're showing it away. So, they, it so, so it, 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 it probably was deep down somewhere there that you didn't what recognize. Did I say? Yes. You couldn't even see, see it because it. it was not present for you. In our workshop language, you said it was in that sphere where you don't even know that you don't know. But, but in you your, know, I want you to get that. 
in your book. You All of it. us have that thing, you know, where you don't even know that you don't know. I know no, that. when yes. you come to know it, you can shift it. What What was I going to say? I want to say to you that you actually, in the book, rejected Michael Manley initially. Actually yes. ran away from him trying to not to get Running into that from place. Running life. Yeah. <laughs> But, but then uh, here you are, you went back and settled with him based on, based on what you're saying now, mom's thought. It was in Jeez, me. Um, that's, 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 uh, it's amazing. And this is why I want to, when I wrote this book, mm -hmm. I was not as evolved in terms of transformation as I like to think I am now. Yes, yes. I use the word evolved because it's not a discipline that makes you better than anybody. Just something you choose to be. Yes, it's yes. to do with your whole sense of being, and some of it is actually even existential, you know, because we have things that you say things in it like um, life is empty and meaningless. And the first time I heard it in a workshop, I was ready to walk out. Empty and meaningless. But guess what? The coach paused deliberately, and then he said, "And it is empty and meaningless." Because it's empty and meaningless. And I understand that for you. <laughs> I, I, I do. Yeah, I, I, uh, based on the it's fact. It's a meaning. That, yes, That's what a, we bring. Do, do, we have, do we really have a meaning? We have meanings. We're meaning making machines, <laughs> right? So something happens and it's a fact. Yes. Something actually happens. But then I give it a meaning. Yes. Now the control and power I have, because I already I believe I was born with greatness inside of me. It's, it may be covered up. Yes. It is covered up. Yes. In some of us, more than some of us. But, I mean, you have to say, yes, something happened, but then you have to it means something. I understand. You know what I mean? I My mother beat me. You can't stop there, you know, yes. or you can't give it an empowering. You have a choice. You can give it an empowering meaning, like she really wanted me to get A, B, or C. Right. Or I can give it a meaning, which is the one I gave it. She doesn't love me. Oh, that, that, and that's, that's where the beautiful. power is. I like, I like that. that you know, I, I spoke Saturday on, uh, uh, I just put it out of the air, and I spoke so, so, so to some kids, gender-based violence, and, and while I sat there, I, I came up with this thing where we need to d define that there is a why in every decision that we make. Right at that crux of that why, right, is something happened. In your case, it's a beating, and, and you could take one direction or, in, or you can take the other direction right and i was telling them once you take one direction that other one is lost it's gone you, you, you don't you don't that no exists anymore even if you come back to it and try to regain it's not the same thing right so it's not that it's it doesn't exist, exist anymore it's, it's still it's there not but, present for you right right, right. so yeah. and you're correct and i yes. like how you did this yes because our our work is grounded in what we call distinctions which is a term again that landmark uses and so we have some tools that, for example, you have one, one tool which I'll share with, mm -hmm. with you is to do with fact and interpretation. And I do this just like what you just wow. said. <laughs> fact, interpretation. <laughs> what, when it's present to you that the, in, the fact you have held on to all your life is not really the fact, but your interpretation of the fact. Yes. And then guess what? After a while, the interpretation becomes Takes the braille, fact. Right? Yeah. So, <laughs> so the fact doesn't exist anymore. No, the it's, the yes. interpretation. it's the interpretation. So, ask me about my mother. I won't say she beat me when I was young. Guess I what see. I say? I know she never. I know you know yeah. that she didn't love me. Now, when you do that, and it's something I use with your permission, it's <laughs> it's similar to to describing what actually happens. Because when you get that insight, that your interpretation will come to fact. Something happens. You get the insight, and you can enter a whole new realm. realm a whole new realm. <laughs> I've, because I've in future, what you do, you say, "Where am I coming from?" Factor interpretation. So my daughter said a to me, "What did I have it mean?" And what I had it mean did that become my interpret? Did that, did that become my fact about what she did or what she said? Right. The minute I get that, I'm coming from interpretation. I'm ready to soar. Let me read something to you. I, I, I have to read this because you, 
and you can explain it to me, he says, um, we also spend time with other couples on weekends, Barclay and Glenn Ebert, Douglas and Sheila Graham. Oh my God, that's in the book. And then he said, he said, okay, and Angela Melhedo and John uh, and Valerie Mar Marzuka. What, what's the meaning of okay and Angela? Oh, what does that mean? There's okay actually in the book? Yes, it is. Okay? Yes. I, I mean, I, I, I got stuck on it. I have to interpret now. Right? Oh, please do. <laughs> I, I'm, it's really important to me. Yes. I must come to, I have not read the book. And this may be typical of authors. I don't I've never asked. I've not read the book since I wrote it. Oh, okay, okay. I don't have the courage to read it again. No. Um, and I can, I can choose to read it. I can choose differently. Okay. okay. Uh, but I'm not in a hurry to choose differently. Right, because, right. Um, you know, the reason I bring it, I brought it out is because I thought, why? Because I didn't know which way to take it. Why or what is said? Let's okay. get it Let's get What it are right. the facts? The facts. What, what <laughs> right. actually say? Okay, so the facts... Are, I'm hearing why and I'm hearing okay. Okay, the facts are that you had friendships with these people. I get what that. Then? But you're questioning me about why or okay. 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 Oh, see, yes, okay. That's, that's what you're yeah, and, and yes, yes, okay. yes, yes, yes. So the fact your question, why did I put okay? Yes. And I'm telling you that it's been so long that I would have to interpret. Okay. All right. My interpretation of why I put okay like that in the book would have to do something with, with with the fact that when I came into the relationship, I didn't just come into a relationship with Michael. I came into a relationship with Michael and his friends. friends. And the friends, it was a close knit group of high brown friends. Yes. I'm not making as an item, we don't make anything wrong in my thing, transformation. That's Everything right. is as it is. Yes, it is. So when I say high brown friends, I'm not saying to another rabbit man. My mother was high brown. No. My, my grandchildren. I don't think oh, that way either. I don't think that way either. My grandchildren <laughs> are the highest brown. <laughs> So I came in, I remember now, you know, I'm coming in with my own stuff. Yes. And a big part of the stuff I came in was because I was darker right. than the rest of my siblings. Mm -hmm. I was shut out. I was the one who had to do the hard work. I, all these things, a lot of which I think were made up, but they were real for me right. growing up. So here I am now coming into a setting where I'm the odd one out. I've again. always felt I'm the odd one out. I wanted to say again, it was just who I thought oh. I was. Okay. I can't even say again. Okay. It was just natural for me to be the odd one. So maybe that okay could be a kind of almost sarcastic okay. Mm -hmm. So that's what I came into. Okay, I'm going to make the best of it. <laughs> so one of the ways in which I made the best of it was to make sure. And you could say anything to Michael. Yes. He was extraordinary that way. He was brought up so that you gave honest, you wouldn't call this, call it this, but honest feedback. Yes. I was brought up that if something was upsetting me, I keep it to myself. Yes, yes. I yes. drink a glass of water. Yes. My mother said, Don't bother me, girl, go drink some water and cool down. Oh, well. So he taught me how to be able to share with him, no matter how hurtful or no matter what I thought the consequences would be, because there would be no bad consequences. So I said to him, we have to enlarge in this room, because I don't see me there. <laughs> and he said, oh my God, no, that was hidden to him. I said, oh my God, of course. So in future I went to the pantomime and so on. Yeah. We'd include some of my family, some of my friends. He never ever wanted to include them in a but it was just hidden from him that he was in this, like, almost like a cocoon, yes. where he felt very safe and where he was very safe. There were people who loved him, who took care of him. All his needs were met. And I mean all yes. his needs. Yeah, I mean, I, I saw it. I, I don't want a follow-up question to that. I don't mind, I don't, no mind. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> Let me, let me lighten it a little bit. <laughs> the thing is, I found it quite profound the day when you were recognized as a TV person. Yeah, because, uh, tell us, tell me, tell me you that day. Yes, man, because it was profound. I want to know how you 
felt what um first when that man said to you you look like somebody on camera and you know i can't find him i don't even know if he's alive i'm <laughs> sure if he's alive he's in california because you you're holding very high well i mean i don't know what he saw but um he just i want i just felt well I was in London for two years. When I was while I was in London, look over maybe a year and a half. While I was in London, I did a course in film technique. Right. So I was drawn to film because Perry Hensel, cut a long story short, I think it's all in the book, Perry Hensel of the Holiday Company asked me if I would come and help out in his office. Because um, his secretary had my leave. She was going to work for a month. At the time, I was looking for a job. I didn't know where I was going. Didn't know what I wanted to do. And I said, well, I'm not doing anything. I'll come. And that worked out very well. And then his secretary phoned to say she was not coming back. So he asked me if I would just stay at least until I knew what I wanted to do. And that was where it all began. Because I got into that world. I never did do my work behind the camera. But I found it very helpful being in front of the camera because of the study program I had done right. behind the camera. Right. I never thought of a link. Yes. I don't even think I've ever said this before, but when I look back on it now, that really helped. I know oh. when the camera was on me, I know when it wasn't on me, <laughs> we're working as a team. That's when I learned teamwork. Team. Yes. In radio, you can probably get away by with yourself. not doing teamwork. Right, right. But in my day, you had to have an operator across the glass. Right. So you had that team. Yes. In television, you have to have our six people. You had to get on with everybody. So right. we created social relations. We go to the beach together. We do all kind of things. Right. So right. when I went, I came back from London. I came back to Perry. Perry, I had no money. I hated being in London. I hated the racism. Even today, when people tell me, they love London. I said, really? <laughs> My children love it. My son lives there. My daughter is living there. Right. Michael loved it. And of course, going to London with Michael, a little bit from, from being a student. Um, no, no. Going to London with Michael was saying, yeah. five star hotel. Right. People waiting. I mean, it's, right. it's a different scene. Right. But to be there as a student in the late 60s, I mean, there were signs on apartment buildings that said, no blacks or dogs. I mean, you had to be there to know how. It was not nice. And my younger sister was there. She was there ahead of me. And we just decided we to come home. But of course, we didn't have any money to buy a ticket. Mm. So I called Perry. He needed me to come. And I said to Perry, I can't wait to get up there. He said, let me send you the ticket. <laughs> He's one of my favorite people. He taught me so much. And so when I came back, I'm sitting in his office at work. And this man comes in and he says, um, you should be on television or something like yes. that. I said, what? <laughs> you don't know how shy, desperate shy I am. I couldn't walk from here to there. Oh, I'm not feeling the entire world was laughing at me. So I said, no, 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 no. Yes, my hand. Yeah. No, 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 no. I cannot do television. You are crazy. And that man never stopped. Stop. You know, it's it's so helpful. And you have to give thanks when you have somebody like that in your life. Yeah. He never stopped. He said, come, I'm coming for you, and we're going to the ABC. And the general manager, I think, was a good friend of his at the time. Not think, he was. And we went down, and they set up a camera, and asked me some questions, something. And when it was finished, she said, oh my God, I knew it, I knew it, I knew it. The thing is with television, and maybe it's a gift that we bring, there's something called presence, and you get it when you are on stage, too. There are some people who will walk on stage and do a part and they just have a certain presence. So somebody else may walk on and have a simple line like, I'm going into the into rural Jamaica today. And then somebody else who has this gift from inside, this present, Leone Forbes, would walk on and say, you know? and, and, and you just get it. Yes, yes. So you can learn it, or I believe you can come with it. And when you come with it, and learn it as well, as when I think it's powerful. So I was fortunate that that's what they saw in me. And that was it. Never worked behind the camera from them. I was always on camera, and happily 
So. Yes. 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 Yeah, I, I, I took from that a lot of learning. Because yeah. um, I, I am in front of the camera, but I'm not really in front of the camera. You know, I, and so this is where I thrive best because I want to talk and, and chat and find out a lot more. Um, Can I just say something on that? Because we're really having more than an interview, we're having a conversation. Yes, that's what it is. And um, what I already pick up in you, because I, I mentor people one on one. Yes. Um, in anything at all to do with broadcasting. I mean, you just have to phone me, so Beverly, come and give me whatever. Right. And when I know I have a passion for it, because I do it, whether I'm paid or not, has, transformation has given me a completely different approach to like money. Um, yes, in this life you need to have money, but it really doesn't have to control what you do. I mean, once you're being authentic, you have your vision, and you know what you're stepping into, the universe, as they say, comes to meet you. And what I pick up in you immediately is one, your authenticity. You really want to know something about me. And secondly, and of equal importance, you actually listen. <laughs> if you watch television okay. overseas, anywhere, international television, local television, and just watch, just to play a game and say, let me see if that person is listening. They ask you the same question. Oh, okay. That you answer. No, no, you you watch it from now. It's a very challenging thing for people to learn to listen. And in our work in transformation, listening is the biggest thing, even more than articulating. Listening. Because and then you can choose where am I listening from. That's true. We don't just have to listen ad hoc. That's true. We could say I'm listening from a place like today. I'm listening to you from a place where I'm doing this interview because I'd like somebody to learn something from it. That's why I'm listening I to am. you. So I my am. my responses to you would be like the way they are because yes. I've chosen. That's what I want to do. Thank you very much. <laughs> I um I read also in the book where you said that I didn't know much about this part. Michael was a people person and he loves, he said, he would love to be black. That was performed, right? Um, and then he would fight for his black man for anything. Redemption. <laughs> here's here's, my, here, here's what, what, I, what I came up with though. You had to teach him though about curry goat and oxtail and fried dumpling and It's stuff. one of the things I most criticized and, for and, in right. the book. So tell me about that part. It's um let me take maybe in that at that time I would have said teach. I wouldn't say teach now. Um, two people come together with their various experiences and we learn from each other, right? And in very practical ways we learn from each other. So he he was into gourmet food. And you really introduced me to gourmet right. food. I, I remember the escargot. Oh my God, that was so hard. <laughs> and my mother would never have that. Enough. We'll talk about that later. My mother would call that nice thing. You know. <laughs> <laughs> and cow tongue. And yes, 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 yes. Um, whereas I was brought up into that yes. other kind of food. That's how that was. For me, it wasn't a big deal. Okay. And it came in the book because I was attempting to show cultural differences. The cultural difference. um, it's, it's challenging to be married in the first place and but when you come from the two different cultures it can be even more challenging if you're not ready for the learning that has to take place. Yes. But where he was and I wanted us to keep saying it, he was an unusual type of human being. I know that. I, I, I saw mean that. extraordinarily so because he could take him almost anything. You could say, as I said before, almost anything to him. And he was open. We're going to this dinner. He said, don't worry about it. I was worried about it because it was about 10 of us going to dinner. And, you know, I didn't really know anybody. You know, yeah. The only time I really got in touch with these people was when I was being interviewed, uh -huh. which is a totally different Difference. relationship. Mm -hmm. And he said, listen, no matter how they seat us, I'm going to sit beside you. You will feel my foot on you. <laughs> you will just comforting you. And whatever happens, 
it's okay because I'm there. Yes. I'm there. Most I could not have survived without that approach. I remember when we got engaged, it was fairly well known in the PMP that we were engaged by that time. And a principal, a woman in the PMP was having a fundraiser for him. And she, he was in Prime Minister State and she called him and told him and he said fine. So when the invitation came, only his name was on it. So he called her up, he said, I don't I know, something's wrong here, I don't see Beverly's name on it. And she went into this long argument why I could not be there. And he said, that's okay. Beverly's not there, neither am I. <laughs> no, I'm just saying. And then when he told me that, I said, no, it's better if I don't go. He said, what? <laughs> So you're coming and you're going to be safe. Now, I played that role for him, particularly after the 1980 election, when we were alienated by who is who in the society. You know, we were the kind of rebels who had matched up Jamaica, right? And so the first time we attempted to go out, like to a cocktail party, I, I had to be the foot he was for me at that other dinner party. He said, just hold me, Beverly, just hold Jesus. me, just hold me, and we're really holding each other. But it was easier for me to walk in there than for him, obviously. And he said, just hold me, just hold on to me, just hold on to me, I'll get through this, I'll get through this. Deep down, did you find that you were deeply, I know what you wrote, eh? do you find that you were deeply in love with Michael Manley? And I remember in the book, the most profound part of the book is when you left that escargot dinner after you choked, you spilled the thing on the floor and thing, right? It took on a time. It took on a time. It took on right? Okay, okay. And, and, and I remember. I love escargot. No? no, no, you do. No, you do, right? I have a whole meal, <laughs> which I've done. So, I, I remember how you said Michael sat in front of you after the escargot fell on the floor and took his life on his own and you looked in his eyes and it was comforting, right? Right, you know, I just say he sat beside me, you know, he's in front of me. He's right, he's there, yes. That's the memory. And I, then the thing is, he, he, when you were going home, you were laughing about it. By then, yes. Yes. But what you said was based on his response at dinner, how he comforted you there, yes. and what he said to you in the car, you find that you're falling in love deeply. Well, I had already fallen. I mean, I <laughs> after resisting him, <laughs> after resisting him, and so, I say in the book, and I always say that he, he, he sort of pursued you like an 18th century lover. Yes. I mean, everything. Flowers three times a day. Wow. Uh, putting a telephone line in my flat that only he and I, when it rang, I knew it was him. Um, listening to my life as, a, as the only person. I mean, he, I could not escape. I tried him up because he was so much older than me. And when I shared it with one or two of my friends, I just laughed. He said, I was an old man. Because yes, yes, he knows yes, yes. he's 18 years older than me. So. Um, he really knew how to make a woman feel fantastic. And when I talk at these people say, but you left him. <laughs> but when I, I think I said in the book, I gave up, when I met him, I gave up everything I had and followed him. Literally, because mm -hmm. I was just about to go to university, because growing up the way I did, my first sister went to university, and that was it. Mm -hmm. And I always promised myself, that as I grew old, I'd get a chance for university. So I had left JVC, I was about to leave, going to Canada to continue my broadcasting career. And um, met him. Yeah. You know, everything just faded into the city. Uh, they call it oblivion. I, I was not as <laughs> oblivion. I was, <laughs> I was doing theater at the time, I remember. I filmed a play called Black Comedy. Yeah. We're doing it at the um, university. And he would come and we drop in there and sit outside in the car. As people were in that field with me and just wait until I was finished. Every night. I couldn't. And then I fell in love with his intellect yes. first. Yes. It's funny because Perry Hendry was the one who taught me, who said to me, you need to read 
read. You have an intellect that's amazing, but you just need to read. And he gave me a set of books to read. He really mentored me. And we had this wonderful relationship that never had any intimacy in it in the sense of sex, but Perry and I just came. Now, brother and sister, he used to cry on my shoulder, cry on his. You know, we're just, he just came into my life at a moment when I was ready to make a shift. And Michael continued it in terms of the intellect, except that, of course, now it was mixed with other stuff. Yeah. So, his whole vision for a world of equality and social justice, many ideas I had never given deep thought before, was just fascinating for me. And it still stays, it, it's something like it, it has become a part of me. So that um, I still come from that space. And when people say to me, and I was spoiled to rotten in the relationship. Oh, you? Yeah, yeah. I didn't look at it as spoiled, but we <laughs> fell in love, and his other wives and so on admit to it. That it's he almost like he had a, this may sound cynical, but it's almost like he had a module for falling in love, a manual. And I don't mean it to sound. No man, no man, no man. I, I, I heard that before. Fell, <laughs> he fell. And the same pattern of the roses and the looking after you. I would go home and sleep because I think I said it back on my birthday. And there's a dress on the bed from Saxe Fifth Avenue that they had bought on his last trip with all the accessories. And he says, We're going to Blue Mountain in for dinner tonight. All he required was that I put, the, put those clothes on and look fabulous. <laughs> so he's, that's what I mean by spoiled. If I say I had a headache, three doctors arrived at the house and did oh it. My God. It was a little overwhelming for me. Yes. Because I had that. That's not the way you grew up. On. Yeah. I even felt I was worth all that. That was part of what I had to deal with. <laughs> but I always say that one of the reasons for divorce should be inconsistency in ideology. Oh, explain that for me. If anything mind. broke up my mind, it wasn't falling off of But I went into the marriage with him teaching me about democratic socialism, the importance of ideology, the way the world was set up in the Cold War, he really taught me. After 1980, when the whole world turned and turned with it, so that a lot of the stuff in the ideology that we do, that was to part get. of us, mm -hmm. we had to almost disappear. So he, he, I couldn't handle it. There's something that I, I couldn't handle it. And I remember him saying to me, take some time off, everybody. Don't let the marriage go. Because remember, this was his fourth marriage, and he wanted it to be his last. He, wanted it, he really wanted it. He loved the church, he just wanted to be his last. And I just couldn't help to do it. And by then, in all fairness, I had started to have deep conversations with the left wing of the party who had his support, full support, up to 1980, or who wouldn't survive. Right? After 1980, when he began to question, and when I look back on it, I can understand from his point of view. Why, what we're doing doesn't make sense in the way the world was now, okay. the whole globalization and so on. How do you look back on, on, on the divorce and the reason for the divorce versus your growth into the relationship with him? Because obviously you, you had a lot of respect for him. My for his stuff. Yes. For yeah, man, it, it, tell me about it, the, it was all mixed tell up. About, Just if yeah. it, it's, I haven't seen it explained anywhere. And maybe one of the reasons I cannot write the second book, or I've not been chosen to write the second book, let me put it that way, is because in my life there's a mixture of being in love and ideology. Ah, Without I, the ideology, I don't no think love. there would have been that kind of love that I had for him. And so when the ideology started to kind of dissipate, so did the love. It was like a and is one of the entanglements that so, I So during, during your the dating process then, his, 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 his passion for the ideology was coming out in the dating process. And I think he saw in me, um, he saw how it resonated in me. Um, 
Okay. I mean, his passion for this world of justice and, you know, and, and the whole thing about social class and calling Jamaica. Did he lose music. that? Did he lose that? I don't think he ever lost it. I think what happened to him, and he, I mean, he was his own words. He said, well, I just can't do that anymore. It was one of our crying moments. Uh, Beverly, I just can't do that did anymore. You? So what about... And neither could I. What, what about you? When I said neither could I. I understand. If he couldn't do it. Then you don't want to be... Uh, yeah, yeah, I, I understood that. Woo! Um, so, so... You know you, I have to go, you don't I know, I know, I know, I want to understand <laughs> this part here. <laughs> I, I hope you're feeling me the way I'm feeling you. <laughs> Right, uh, I, I know, man. Uh, all right, so so all right. So that's, that's one last question. Uh, the, the, you know, how do you feel now writing this book? It's a beautiful book. Looking back at your relationship with Michael, and today, how do you feel today? When I look back from today, yes, I'm far more compassionate um, about him and the decisions he had to take. I don't know how I would manage without my... Um, I don't know how I would manage without the, the, the transformation work that I'm doing, ah. which prevents me from, as we say, making anybody wrong. Ah. There's nothing he did that he could do to me if I had not chosen that he could do it to me. And that's what I mean when I say, anybody listening, we say, what kind of foolishness, you know, whatever. Uh, I find that when human beings resist and say, what kind of foolishness, it's time to take a deep breath that's and listen. Exactly, that's exactly right. <laughs> I agree. So I'm at a stage now where nobody can do anything to me without my permission. I like that. It's a powerful stage to be at. It doesn't matter what it looks like. It doesn't matter what is the There's something going on in my consciousness that is attracting that. Yeah. So what I need to explore is not to blame the person, right. but again go into the interior landscape and say, yeah. what's going on such that? Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So I look back at him from a point of view of loving him. Loving him. Forgiving myself for anything. I said to myself about him, no matter what he did, I used to talk about forgiving him, that was all. Right. I forgive myself for First what I had said. his actions mean. So it's, it's a completely different person. I'll never forget when he was dying. He sent for me and asked me. He said to me, I'm going to ask you for, to do something for me. And I stopped him and I said, it's done. He said, but you don't know what it is. <laughs> <laughs> it's done. What's up? Even before he asked. And I just want to say something about the two children that we, yes. both of us brought into this world. Both of them unique in their own way. My daughter Natasha has the, she, she, she has the, she gets her strength, enormous strength, from the two of us combined. And sometimes it's threatening. She has enormous courage. And one of the things I appreciate about her is that she has this sense of freedom. She knows who she is, and she's living that life. You can't <laughs> say to her, do this or do that. Yeah, I mean, it's a very, it's almost like, She's audacious. And I'm saying to myself, in a future generation, that will be me. This is why I have to be so careful with her and not criticizing her because when I was her age, I came into the politics, I think, in my late 20s. I was fearless for what I believed in. And people would have seen me maybe the way I see her now. And it is so heartening to see the generations continuing in the sense of knowing who we are and doing what we have to do and just having the courage to do it. My son David now is, he combines his courage with his, 
with his father's compassion. Because Aldo Mack was the kind of person who lied down in the street at a JBT I remember, I remember reading about that. A very important part of Michael was just his compassion. His compassion. Not that Natasha doesn't have it, you know, but David shows it up more. So they are like, a, almost like a yin and yang. Yes, yeah. And um, he would be very proud of them, as he was with all his children. And the final thing is, if he had a wish about his children, it would be that they stayed in touch with each other. Now these are children that came from four different marriages. Are, are they in touch? And they are in touch with each other. They try once a year to actually physically be together. Mm -hmm. And they are not just in touch. I mean, they are siblings, they are family. Rachel? Rachel, first one, um, Joseph, Sarah, Natasha and David.